It's a pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker today, Dr. Maya Hamoud. Dr. Maya is the J. Robert Wilson Research Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Professor of Learning Health Sciences at the University of Michigan Medical School. She is the Chief of Women's Health Division and Associate Chair for Education. Dr. Hamoud holds many leadership roles nationally. She's Senior Advisor for Medical Education Innovations at the American Medical Association, the AMA, with a focus on health system science and coaching. She has over 90 peer-reviewed publications and has published four books. She's past president for the Association of Professors of Gynecology and Obstetrics, APGO, and a member of the National Board of Medical Examiners Board of Directors. Today, Dr. Hamoud is going to talk to us about the role of mentorship and coaching in medical education. Welcome, Maya, and thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Greetings, everybody, and I wish if I could be with you in person, uh, but I really appreciate the invitation and the ability to talk about this really important topic. So I'm hoping to talk today about, um, focus quite a bit on coaching and talk about how is that different from mentoring? You know, we all can think of mentors that have helped us and why is coaching now becoming uh, very popular in medical education? How does it help us all as learners and as physicians? Uh, just a couple of disclosures, as um, uh, was mentioned, I am uh, I work for the American Medical Association as a consultant, and I'm on uh, the boards of APCO and the MBME. I'm also a co-editor on the coaching books that I'll be sharing with you, but I don't get any um, money out of selling these books, but I do think that they're good references. Uh, what I'm hoping to accomplish today is to define coaching and talk about how it differs from advising, mentoring, and other traditional faculty roles. Uh, describe the master adaptive learner and explain how coaching supports the master adaptive learner model. So what is coaching? And I think most of you, when you think about coaching, you think of a football coach or you think about somebody who coaches someone on music. Uh, now you think probably what does coaching have to do with medical education? And, you know, coaching has actually been adopted by a lot of professions, including the business world, where we find that coaching um, everyone, especially executives, actually helps people quite a bit with their uh, development and, and doing better in their jobs. And now in medical education, we're starting to talk about coaching a lot more because it does help us in what we do every day. And I want to start by saying that coaching is not therapy. Uh, coaching is different than therapy and is different than uh, mentoring and advising. And that's one I want to cover a little bit here. But um, the definition of coaching in medical education is to support a developmental process where an individual learner meets regularly over time with a faculty coach to create goals, identify strategies to manage existing and potential challenges, improve academic performance, and further professional identity development toward reaching the learner's highest potential. So there's a lot packed in here, but basically it's a lot of it is focused on goals, which typically we don't do that in mentoring. We might ask what the goals are, but we're not spending a lot of time figuring out the goals of the learner or even me as a faculty member. And also how do we address our challenges? How do we improve our academic performance? And I think about that even for me as a physician who's been practicing 20 years, I still have to think about what areas I need to improve in for the continuous lifelong learning. And how do we actually make, make sure that everybody accomplish their highest potential? Um, so there are some principles of coaching relationship, which me as a coach, and I do coach a lot of learners. I coach medical students, I coach residents, and I also coach faculty, both at the University of Michigan and outside of Michigan. Um, because I'm a certified uh, executive coach, so I do coach a lot of different levels of learners and faculty, but I also will tell you that I have my own coach, and I feel like my own coach has helped me quite a bit in actually being better at the job that I do every day, especially in my leadership positions. So a coach will ask provocative questions and encourage the learners to arrive at his or own answers whenever possible. So when I meet with my coach, oftentimes my coach is asking me a lot of questions and I'm thinking through stuff. I'd be like, oh, that's an interesting way to think about it. Uh, because the idea is that I come up with my own answer. They don't tell me what the answer is. And um, the coach also includes realistic expectations and goals. So if I set a really high goal, or if your learner sets a really high goal, you kind of talk with them about, are they going to be able to achieve that goal? or How are they going to be able to achieve that goal? 
And you also help the learner identify and fully engage in his or her strength. And we'll talk a lot about how in medicine, we often focus on the gaps, not on people's strength. And what you find is that when we focus on people's strength, we end up doing a lot better in terms of um, reaching their goals. And I acknowledge when an issue is outside the skill set of a coach and they commend other resources. If you recall, I started by saying coaching is not therapy. So if I'm meeting with, with a faculty member, for example, in a coaching session or a resident, for example, and I found that they probably are suffering from, um, from other issues or depression or something else, then I do refer them because that is not what I do. So it is important to recognize when that relationship is beyond the skill set of me as a coach and when do I refer people. And this is a really nice slide summary that tells you the difference between these things. So typically when you think of advisor, as advisor, I advise the people around me, I tell them what to do. So I'm giving them, I'm giving them answers. But a coach actually asks questions more than they give answers. So if I have somebody who, if I have a faculty member who comes to me and says, well, I'm having a challenge with implementing this new program then an advisor will say, well, what I think you should do is A, B, C, D, as opposed to a coach will actually sit and ask questions. What are some of the challenges you've had? What are other times you've been successful that you're able to do this? So you can see it's very different in terms of the relationship. And then again, when you think of uh, the faculty being as the expert, this is what teachers are. We teach, uh, we tell learners stuff, we tell other faculty stuff. You're all going to be in that um, conference in the next few days where people are coming and teaching and teaching you things that they know that you don't know. So that's what they are the experts who are passing on information to you. Whereas in a coaching relationship, we consider the learner or the coachee is the expert because the answers lie within me. And I just need someone to ask me those questions for me to arrive at my own solutions. Uh, so this gives you a really nice summary of the difference between an advisor and a mentor. And the advisor is someone who knows information on a certain topic. And then when they meet with somebody, they can give them the information. The mentor is longitudinal where like I do have a couple mentors who have helped me throughout my whole career. And I have a very long relationship with them. They've known me since I was a medical student, some of them, and they helped me with solving problems. But again, this relationship is different from coaching where the coaching could be actually a small uh, engagement it could be six months or a year that you actually engage a coach who helps you get through something. And we often recommend coaching when people are at transitions in their career. So if somebody is going from, uh, let's say somebody is, uh, has been a faculty member for a few years and now they have the opportunity to be a director or a dean, then you, you know engaging a coach on that transition would be really important for them. And this, this is also a nice summary. So the advisor will say, someone do this. The mentor will say, let me teach you how to do this. And the coach would say, how do you think you could do this? And you can see the advantage of coaching here and that the coach actually is asking you how you think you can do it and you arrive to your own solutions. And I feel that when we do that, then that person has more autonomy into doing what they want to do and they know what their strengths are and it helps them better. Because the truth is what worked for me as uh, your mentor might not work for you because we all have different personalities. Uh, so a mentor is great, but it doesn't always, the same thing does not always work for everybody. And the coaching will actually focus on those strengths. So our usual approach is what is the diagnosis? Where is the gap? What problem can I help you with? This is what we do in medicine. You know, when we meet with patients, we're thinking about what are the issues are. That's our typical approach. When we think about coaching, it's a little bit different. We call the appreciative inquiry. So we appreciate what's working. We lead with questions. We envision what might be. And I'm going to give you an example and, uh, of this in a minute. But the appreciating what's working is actually what helps people think of the strength and how do we apply our strength to solve problems. So this is what the appreciative inquiry, we call the 5D approach. So define what is our focus. We discover what's working well. We dream, what would it be the ideal future situation be like? We design what needs to be differently to achieve this. And then we talk about the destiny, what needs to be ensure that the changes continue. And um, actually going back here for a minute, I um, the way that we can think about this is for example, let's say that um, 
Um, you know, we tend to not focus on people's strength. And what you find is when you focus on their strength, they're much more likely to solve a problem. So I'm going to give you my own example that I had from my own coach. I took over as a division director and uh, there were some challenges when I first, I, I overlooked 35 faculties and there were some challenges initially. So when I met with my coach, I said, you know, those meetings with my faculty are not going as well as I would like them to be. And he said, well, what is the goal that you want to accomplish? And I said, there are some problems that we want to solve. And I'd like us to be able to talk about them during those meetings. Then my coach says, well, what? give me an example of a meeting that worked well. How did that work? And for him to help me think about that meeting that worked well. So what is the strength that I applied during that meeting? And it didn't have to be on my fact, it could be other meetings. So what do you do at those meetings that are successful? And how can you take what you do there and apply them with your faculty? And we talked about how, okay, listening to people, actually understanding all the stakeholders, what they want, and then said, okay, so if we take those and think about you had a successful meeting, what is the outcome going to be? And then we talked about what would I do differently during those typical meetings that I have? And then how do I evaluate at the end that I accomplish what I want? And I will tell you, it took only two more meetings for me to feel that the meetings are much, much better because my coach helped me think through what are my strengths? How do I apply them to this? And this could apply to any problem in, that you're facing or any challenge that you're about to undertake. And it, you don't have to have really a um, expert coach to help you through this. You can have a friend who asks you these questions. If you have a challenge, talk to your friend or to your colleague and say, only ask me questions about it. Don't tell me what to do. And you'll see by them asking you questions that you will arrive to how you want to approach the problem. It's actually very powerful. If we were doing this in real time, we would actually take time to, to practice it a little bit. And you'll see the power of actually taking a break and having someone just ask you questions about a problem that you're trying to solve. There are a couple of um, really quick tools that I would like to talk about um, that you could use. And you can use this with anybody. You can use it with a colleague who is challenged with a problem, or you can use it with um, a resident or a medical student you're working with. One of those uh, things, we call it the WHOOP, which is W stands for wish, uh, the O for outcome, the other O for obstacle, and then the plan. So think about any interaction you have with anybody around solving a problem and think about how you might utilize that. So um, uh, Dr. Shaheen would like to have a successful, um, successful conference over the next couple of days. So that is her wish. Her wish is I have a successful conference. Then I might say to her, well, what is the outcome? What is gonna tell you that you're gonna have a successful conference? And then she'll be like, well, the evaluations will be great. People want, want more. People want to come back again and do this. Say, so, well, what, what could be some of the obstacles? I know if I'm running a big conference, some of the obstacles are like, are people going to be engaged? Are they going to like what I'm going to present to them? Uh, and then we'll say, okay, so how are we going to overcome some of those obstacles? And then she'll think of her plan. Well, I'm going to do something that is relevant to them, something that they care about. I'm also going to make sure that all my sessions are engaging uh, so people do get engaged in the conversation. We're going to not just do lectures, but we're also going to ask questions. And those that's how she comes up with the plan about how she's going to meet her goal of having a successful conference. And hopefully your conference will be very successful. Yeah, people are traditionally have talked about SMART goals, um, which stand for, uh, stand for specific measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So that's another way of actually thinking about goals. So when you have someone set goals, is you ask them, what specifically do you want to do? How are you going to measure it? And you notice that in the WHOOP, we did talk a little bit about that example that I used. So when I talk to Dr. Shane, what specifically do you want to do? I want to put a successful conference together. How are you going to measure that it is uh, successful? I'm going to look at my evaluations at the end. Is it in your power to accomplish it? Yeah, we do control some of it to actually put a good conference together. And then we need to see if people respond to what we put. Can you realistically achieve it? So if she says, well, I want to have perfect fives on every single session. Well, is that realistic? We all know not 100% of the people are going to think everything is perfect. So we're going to say, well, you know, let's set a goal where you know that it could be achievable because it's not realistic to think that everybody is going to be engaged at every single minute and they're going to actually love every part of it. And then timely, when exactly do you want to accomplish it? So sometimes people are thinking about long-term goals and we need to think about how far down the road. So if I say, for me, for example, I want to learn a new procedure 
And if I say I want to learn it by tomorrow, that might not be realistic because I have to do it over and over again. So I might say I want to learn something new maybe in six months. Uh, and that's how you work with the, that SMART goal. And then what they found is actually the WHOOP works really much better than SMART. People like that. But either of those are actually very acceptable when you're setting goals with anyone you're with your learner or with your other faculty or anyone that you're working with. And even think about your own goals when you set them, right? So what do I want to accomplish over the next year in my position right now? Or it could be long-term. What is my goal? What is my ultimate position? I'd like to, what, what do I like to be eventually in life? What, is there something else I want to still do? And then again, this is where time becomes important. If I say I want to be the president of the university, I'm not going to accomplish that tomorrow, but I have to think about what are the steps to get me there. And these are the uh, the types of tools that help you for yourself and also when you're dealing with others. So there are some uh, whoop steps and whoop tips. And here I'm using an example of a learner who wants to learn about sepsis. And the goal should be important to you. It should be attainable, but challenging. So we don't set easy goals to, to achieve them very quickly. Uh, so, but we want to set goals that we think are challenging. Then we talk about what are the outcomes that we want. This should be the single best outcome which are you achieving the goal for you. So you have to achieve that. You have to imagine what the outcome is. And then you talk about what the obstacles, the obstacle could be internal. Uh, uh, the obstacles should be internal in this case, because you want to overcome them. I do not control the environment around me, but I can control what it is that I do. And we must imagine what that obstacle could be. And then the planned action to promote the goal and should be the action should be one that it would actually help us overcome the obstacle. Kind of the example I use with having a successful conference, I can't really force people to engage, but I'm in control of how I set the session for people to engage by asking questions and by getting them engaged in that fashion. I want to talk briefly about the Master Adaptive Learner. And the master adaptive learner, uh, the reason that I want to talk about is I think of more as uh, all of us as master adaptive learners, because how do we actually function if efficiently on everyday tasks, but we have the expertise to create solutions for workplace challenges. So we recognize when a routine approach will not work and we frame the problem in new ways that we can solve it. And this is when you have very challenging problems. That's what the master adaptive learner does, is a person who utilizes a metacognitive approach to self-regulated learning that leads to adaptive expertise and development. This is very important for us as physicians. All of you attending the conference in the next two days, that obviously you recognize that you need some extra learning and you're doing that. So you recognize some sort of a gap that you want to fill, which is great. That's what we all need to be doing as physicians. And you can see there are four phases to this the planning phase, the learning phase, the assessment phase, and the adjusting phase. So the planning phase is I say, I wanna learn more about breast uh, issues. The learning phase is I sign up for this conference. The assessing phase is I'm gonna figure out, did I learn everything I want? What do I wanna apply in my practice? And do I want, is there another area that I need to work in? And you can see that the battery for that is actually, the coaching is actually a major area for that. And the battery is, us having the curiosity, the motivation, the growth mindset, and the resilience to actually do this while we have 100 other things to do, because we recognize this is an area we want to improve on. And for those of you who are familiar with quality improvement, you can see this is kind of quality improvement on myself, um, where there's planning, learning, assessing, and adjusting. So in the planning phase, I set my goals. In the learning, I actually do go and do experiential learning, kind of what you're going to be doing over the next two days. And then self-assessment, um, did I learn all I wanted to learn? And then how do I adjust? Which ones do I want to apply? And are there still areas that I feel I need to learn more and I want to go and learn more? And we should all be doing that as physicians, as healthcare professionals to continue to improve, especially in this day and age where things can change on us so quickly. And the bottom line is we want to be our personal best. Just like top athletes and singers have coaches, we should have coaches as physicians. So we are doing our best for our patients, for our community, for, for all, for our society. And these are some references um, that you could uh, use for coaching. Uh, if you're interested in learning more or learning more about the Mass Adaptive Learner, the website has also some webinars that you can listen to if you're interested. And there's my contact information there at the bottom. I also tweet quite a bit. If you're a Twitter, please follow me on Twitter. I tweet about this and other meta uh, information. 
And um, that's all I wanted to share with you today. I wish I could be with you in person. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share this. And please feel free to contact me if you have any questions.